Hey everyone, it's 5.18 a.m. March 7th, supposedly 2017. I want to continue today with what I've been talking about for the last couple of videos concerning circumstantial worldviews. Where I, based on what limited information I have, trying to piece together all of the bits of information concerning history, the Bible, what I understand about man, what I understand about God, Jesus Christ, the history of the church, world affairs, the church not only in this nation, the United States of America, but the church abroad, politics abroad. Um, the current role of the Vatican in world affairs and the current place of the State of Israel in world affairs. I think it's easy for us to be myopic about history, our place in history, and what we expect to happen in our time. And I don't think that that's something that is particular to us. I think it's a defect of maybe maybe it's a defect of those who just don't pay attention to the message in the bible and specifically the message of jesus christ in revelation specifically to the seven churches now this was one of the biggest bothers that I had starting maybe two years ago. I was raised in a, a, a home that was Pentecostal and extremely futurist in their beliefs. This hasn't really changed. There are there's some Pentecostal churches now who are beginning to abandon futurism because they're they're just seeing that there's too many facets about futurism that don't add up. The unfortunate thing is for many of them who are abandoning futurism they are going to preterism. Those who are not going to preterism, the, the few who fall between the cracks of the blocks built from futurism and preterism, who fall through the cracks <clears throat> and are revealed uh, the historicist interpretation of Revelation and uh, apocalyptic literature in the Bible. Unfortunately, they are going to come across certain men who believe things about Revelation that are in part true and also in part false. Again, and uh, I apologize, I live near a train, so you're probably hearing the train in the background, but... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, even those who are now currently teaching the historicist view of Revelation, even in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not to mention those who are, I guess, uh, Pentecostal historicists, because they seem to have about the loudest voice out there besides Seventh-day Adventists. Among all them, they still hold this view that 
we are now currently in the last of the last days. And the thing is, if you pay attention to the writings of those men, so-called apostolic fathers, so-called church fathers, and historians, you'll see that it was not uncommon throughout the ages, all the years that have transpired thus far since the revelation was given to John on Patmos. So many men who believed that they were, in fact, living in the last of the last days. Paul, in his own letters, had to rebuke men who were teaching that the general resurrection of the saints had already happened in his day. In his day. It harkens back to the letters that he had to write to the Thessalonians concerning what was to happen so they wouldn't be shaken in their mind or their doctrine or lose focus on what they were to be doing with their lives as redeemed saints of God in Christ Jesus. And I think even to this day we find ourselves looking at that same kind of paradigm and idea. Everybody, of course, preaching that it's... How long do, how long do men have to preach that we're at the cusp of the very, very end before we will not let our emotions rule over us, but go back to Scripture and pay attention to history and get our heads screwed on straight. It's one of the best, uh, it's one of the greatest dangers of futurism in that those who preach futurism always preach that we are right at the very, very end. And what they are spreading is a defeatist mentality. One in which the myopic and self-obsessed Christian does not do a whole lot to preserve a world for their children, but have in a way given up and given over to darkness, believing that any day, any minute, Christ will come with his secret rapture and take the church out of this world. It's a, a doctrine based on total ignorance of the scripture. On the other hand, the eschatology that is emerging more and more is one that even many conservative evangelicals today um, employ in their reasoning and preach and teach, and that is preterism, that virtually all the events in Revelation transpired in the late first century and were uh, they all <laughs> revolved around Jerusalem the fall of Jerusalem the destruction of the temple and both of those eschatologies take a lot of scriptures and apply a lot of scriptures in a very convincing way the problem with preterism, like futurism, but with preterism, it's a little bit different. And one of the dangers of, of preterism is, is what's happening, I think, right now. is This ideology that the evangelical and 
what's left of the Protestant church, uh, organized Protestant church, that is, in which they are beginning to adopt, along with the Roman Catholic Church, who has had this doctrine for a very long time, they're beginning to adopt an idea of dominionist theology. Now, dominionism goes hand in hand with a preterist eschatology. Unfortunately, in this dominionist mindset, it seems that those who believe that the church, in quotes, will, I suppose, will take over and dominate this temporal world in the name of Christ. My problem with that is the, the peace that the evangelical and Protestant church is making with Roman Catholicism in order to bring in this dominionist theology. And even actually now, many who claim to be futurists hold to that same dominionist theology more and more. Guys like Kenneth Copeland and uh, Pat Robertson and all of those who love money and power, who uh, are part of, uh, they are members of secret societies. Uh, they move in elite circles, many of them outright liars, uh, many of them just absolutely deceived and blinded by their love of money and rank and, and power. And yet, to this day, there is still this, this air uh, throughout um, all of the bench warmers in the churches, um, believing that a rapture event will come at any time, or perhaps if they're dominionists, you know, they believe that uh, the church for good will gain more and more strength as time goes on. Either which way, no matter if we're talking about uh, futurism awaiting a secret rapture, if we're talking about dominion theology that believes that a church that today is extremely ecumenical will somehow uh, dominate the world uh, for good and for Christ. I don't see any of these worldviews accurately representing where we are in history, according to the Bible. And according to what I see happening in the world and happening in what is perceived as the church. So, as, as part of this series of trying to elucidate on the circumstances that are forming my worldviews, because remember, as I've said, we live in, and most of us who even live today, were born into an age, and especially if you're an American, a country, where deception is king. Lies are the order of the day. You, you can't hardly know what information you can trust as being real and accurate. Again, I don't even believe that we're in the year 2017. I, in all sincerity and in all honesty, based on what I've seen, what I've read, and what makes the most sense, believe that we are in 
the 1700s, the early 1700s. If we're starting at zero, uh, being a few years after our Lord Jesus Christ was born, then I would put us in the early 1700s. I know that there are conflicting views on this, and there's a lot of people out there that push the works of Anatoly Fomenko, and I have reason to not only doubt his works, but oppose his, his works. And there's a lot of people that right now believe that the calendar is probably not what they say it is. I would just suggest that if you're going to look into the problems with the calendar and what year they say it is, that you compare the works of Anatoly Fomenko with the works of Illig, Nemitz, and Scott. That's Emmett Scott. I have the whole book read on a guide to the Phantom Dark Age on my channel. I've, I've highly been considering rereading his book along with a few things that they have now published by Herbert Illig in English without commentary. And the reason I put so much commentary into the first time I read through A Guide to the Phantom Dark Age is because a lot of people who would be coming uh, to that or stumbling upon that for the first time would really not know the way that the Vatican, the papacy, and the Jesuits have factored into this problem we have with our calendar. They may not have been there when these things happened, but I think subsequent events and when they happened uh, starting at the time of the Counter-Reformations, being in the early mid-1500s on, have only worked towards their advantage. So I think that they have every reason to be complicit with this calendar problem. So, if I don't think it's 2017, and I'm not a futurist who expects a secret rapture, nor am I a preterist who believes in this dominion theology that the ecumenical church being the evangelical church as a whole and even those who call themselves the Protestant church, organized Protestant church, who are not Protestants any longer along with the Roman Catholic institution centered at the Vatican together will create this great new world that is absolutely the false prophet the specifically American evangelical church even thinking to join hands with the Roman Catholic Church the seat of Satan the Antichrist just serves to further convince me that the country that we live in and the church of this country, in quotes, church, in quotes, because they're not, further convinces me that the United States and its ecclesiastics are the false prophet, second beast of Revelation 13. But, <clears throat> furthermore, Considering whether or not is the end. Well, now, if some people, if some people would say, it's not good to think that Jesus could not come at any moment and bring in God's kingdom on this earth. It's not good to think that. We should um, be ready at any time. Well, every one of us individually should be ready at any time to meet our Lord and our Maker. That's true. You don't know what's going to happen today. You don't know that... It, it's not in the will and plan of God for you to 
meet your death today. You don't know that. I don't know that. We should all remain ready and watchful. We should not fall asleep at the wheel. That is true. We should remain ready and watchful. But you know, Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, he wrote two letters in which he told them concerning the the latter day uh, events um and you know he he didn't tell them that something like the event of a rapture was was going to happen at any time um he told them in in Second Thessalonians uh, 2 1 now brothers concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him we ask you not to be quickly shaken in your mind nor be troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us saying that the day of Christ has already come let no one deceive you in any way for it will not be unless the rebellion come first and the man of sin is revealed the son of destruction he who opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God setting himself up as God so he wasn't telling the Thessalonians even then that that Jesus could come at any time gathering us up to himself he said that there were events that would have to take place so there's nothing wrong with telling people that to know prophecy to know eschatology to know where we are in time to know what has happened and to know what we should expect to happen Nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. <sighs> now, I have spent not as much time as some, but a lot of time reading the book of Revelation. I suggest you do the same thing. Because the book of Revelation itself offers a blessing for reading it, for spending time studying it. Because, for one thing, if you spend an extended time reading and studying Revelation, you will have to study the entire Bible. That's one of the reasons it's so blessed to study this book. You cannot study this book or try to interpret it in any way without spending a great quantity of time throughout the rest of the Bible. You have to. Remember, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You have to interpret scripture by scripture. So it says in Revelation 1, 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written in it, for the time is at hand. Now it is true that I am what is called a historicist. Do I believe all the tenets of what is currently considered historicism no I don't in fact since I know for a fact that the other two big bigger than historicism eschatologies out there futurism and preterism were both invented and promulgated by Jesuits that's a historical fact that's not a conspiracy theory that's a fact look into Francisco Ribera Louis de Alcazar Cardinal Bellarmine and then go into the future and look at the guys who really started spreading these false eschatologies and the oddities about uh, their lives their beliefs and and the events 
of their life, their lives, you'll start to smell a rat. Um, everything about the design and promotion of futurism has got Jesuit written all over it. Same thing with preterism. Now, does everybody who believe uh, who believes in preterism today are are all of them Jesuits? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know who's a Jesuit or who's a Jesuit agent or who's a coadjutor. I can tell you who bears the signs or marks of being one and in what way, but I can't tell you for sure. You have to remember, they're secretive. They are the most secretive, secretive people there are. They have found through trial and error. And remember, they, they were started in, in, in like the 1530s. And when they formed their order, they had had many centuries of men before them who had been attempting the same things that they were about to embark on. So they had a whole history of people doing the kind of things that they were about to start doing to learn from. And then they had their own deeds by trial and error to use, to figure out, to learn, to understand. They had the greatest amount of wealth and power in Europe behind them as they do to this day. It, so it's it's impossible to 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 say that some people are or are not Jesuits. That that's the whole point. It's one of the reasons I I still can't believe that so many people honestly believe that there's this Jewish conspiracy. Yeah, there there is a Jewish conspiracy, but they're not the ones who are pulling all the strings. Remember, if you can see the people and you hear about the people doing the evil things, those aren't the people that are doing them. Keep that, that, that should be a rule of thumb to always follow. But since I know for a fact that it was Jesuits and agents since, and then misguided souls, and those deceived and blind who have kept up pushing futurism in all its many forms and now more than ever preterism as an alternative I fully believe that those same people have been infiltrating and tweaking and throwing off the way that we understand uh, Revelation and other portions of apocalyptic scripture from a historicist standpoint. So, gosh, I mean, I'm getting to the point to where I almost don't even want to call myself a historicist anymore. Historicism mostly just meaning that I believe that Revelation and other portions of apocalyptic, apocalyptic scripture are describing a, a long period of time, not a brief three-and-a-half-year period in time, neither in the first century nor in a time to come. And I have abundant reason to believe this. Um, I go into it in other videos, and you can find a lot of people who can explain to you why the historicist would apply in apocalyptic prophetic literature the day-year principle when time frames are given. There's scriptural reasons for doing that. <clears throat> so in Revelation, in the first couple of chapters, Jesus gives his salutation to seven churches. Now, I've, I've looked very closely at the salutation to these seven churches because I did not want to misinterpret these messages to these churches. I, I did not 
want to think that it was seven distinct manifestations of the Church of Jesus Christ throughout time from the first century when he gave this revelation to John on Patmos until the time when he would come and even after we see in the last few chapters of Revelation. The last few chapters of Revelation, the book assures us of how all things will ultimately be remade um, by God in Christ, the whole creation. So, yeah, it, it, it follows even further forward than the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's kind of, I think it's it's a real stretch to put any of that into a brief time span of, of a few years. Even if there weren't scriptural credentials for the day your principle, which there are, and they're heavy, they're, they're very weighty. So I would give great attention to those things. But even if not, it would really be a head scratcher when you read Revelation and the other apocalyptic literature that accompanies it throughout the Bible, you'd have to say, man, uh, this is all going to happen in three and a half years? That's, that's amazing. I mean, you know, it's no wonder that futurists have this view of apocalyptic literature that's so grim and dark and, and dystopic. But I wanted to make sure that uh, the, the messages to the seven churches, that I was not misinterpreting them, and that perhaps Jesus was, was talking to seven various churches that would all simultaneously coexist, uh, either throughout time from... Um, We'll just say John was given that the book of Revelation in... <sighs> There's this big argument between 65 and 90 A.D. Let's say 90 A.D. I don't care if you say 65 A.D. For, as a historicist, it really doesn't change the, uh, the view of Revelation. It's the preterists and futurists who argue over that date. Because the preterists need it to be 65. Anyways, <clears throat> 90 AD. After looking at all the signs and everything that I could dig up from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and concerning why there would be seven churches, everything I found concerning the number seven. It's always cyclical. It always represents a full, complete cycle. I guess cycle is the best word I can use right now. Um, I, and I'm not saying there was a cycle before this or a cycle to come after this. But what I'm saying is the fullness of time throughout the Bible, Tanakh and New Testament, is represented again and again in seven. Seven days of the week, um, seven years in uh, a full cycle, uh, agrarian cycle, even in a servitude cycle, if, if a man um, sells himself to you as a slave, and that would usually happen when he had a great debt, you would pay off that debt, and he would be your servant for six years, and then you would let him go on the seventh. That's the sabbatical year. You would let your land lie barren for the seventh year. Seven was always a cycle. 
and we see that again in Daniel 9. In fact, Daniel 9 is one of those key areas of Scripture where we can see that there is a great, strong precedent for the day-year principle. Because in Daniel 9, there are 70 weeks. Those weeks are representing seven years. We also see that because a day can be a year and that you have to distinguish this by context throughout the scripture, that's the other reason why we who are called historicists feel very confident in using the day-year principle, aside for the fact that it shows up in Ezekiel 4 and Numbers 14. But I digress from that. So everything that I, I looked at, throughout the Bible showed me that seven was absolutely cyclical, cyclical in time. Not specifically a number that should symbolize another deeper meaning, <clears throat> like with twelves. You have the 144,000, 24 elders, twelve patriarchs and 12 apostles different seven's different seven specifically is always utterly cyclical perfect like as in a perfect cycle so that would be the reason why i believe it is quite fair to apply that principle to the seven churches that Jesus addresses in the first couple of chapters of Revelation. Now, people have been saying for a long time, like I'm telling you, for a long time, they've either been saying that we are right at the cusp of the very, very, very end in which Jesus will return, whether they believe it's going to be a secret rapture event or his second coming, which is what I believe. When he comes back, He's coming back. It's one event. And the Bible teaches nothing but a singular event when he comes. Even Daniel 7 backs that up. So, either they believe that they were right at the cusp of that happening. Or for a long, long time now, they many teachers in church organizations have taught that we are in the Laodicean church age, which is the last church age. And one of the reasons I believe that they think that is because of their own myopathy. Maybe because they don't understand history very well. Maybe it's also because they really do believe it's 2017 or it, back as early as the uh, early 1800s they were thinking this too, or even the 1700s. They were at least thinking we were in that last church age of Laodicea. It seems like every time you ask somebody who's not well-versed on history or the history of the church, they would always have to say, it. it we're in the Laodicean church. And uh, in a way, yeah, I get it. They, they look around them and they see all of the, the unattractive things about the church around them. And... Uh, I guess that's that's what logically follows. They believe that we have to be in, in that last church. Um, it's currently my belief that we haven't even gotten to the Laodicean church age yet. I believe that that's a little ways off, honestly. I have ample reason for believing this based on what I understand about history and what I'm seeing 
happening today within what is the church and what is the church is is the church comprised of this this huge conglomerate of worldwide evangelical churches or uh, Protestants who aren't all that Protestant and some Protestants who are still um, or is the church today those who are are in those institutions that are struggling within themselves to stay because they they're not being fed and not only that they have little to no opportunity to truly help anyone else they 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 couldn't find a person in a, a congregation of a thousand to have a, a, a deep conversation with concerning the deep things of God and the Bible and they're they're starving and dying there's them there's those who cannot stomach what is called the church anymore and they are now very much alone because they they don't want to be disobedient in forsaking um, the fellowship of the brethren and that doesn't mean going to a Sunday service when you hear don't forsake the the brethren and the coming together that does not mean a Sunday morning service that means don't forsake those who that you know are professing Christians because we're a community. We're, we're a temple built of living stones. We're, we're, not to be, we're not to be apart or separate from that. But in so many instances we are because some people just cannot stomach what's called the church anymore. I, I understand that because I, I deal with that too. And you know, I, I don't have an animosity against the people that, that make up what is today's current manifestation uh, of what the world believes is the church. But I do, even in my own soul, I, I feel like I'm either dying when um, <clears throat> I'm among uh, those people who are functioning uh, as the church. It's, it's so difficult. It's so hard to, to go and worship on the day of the sun. It's, it's become impossible to have a dialogue with those who truly believe and will not hear anything to the contrary that God is not one he but is one what made up of three he's i.e. those who believe God is a trinity which I also did for well, my whole life because I was told that that's what God was it was only recently that I began having to question that so there's there's a lot of reasons why many of us find ourselves disenfranchised from the church at large I've heard people use the term the invisible church and uh, I don't think that that's just our era that we happen to be in right now where the church is in many ways made up of people who are invisible, who are unknown to history. Um, 
you know we 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 have we have a history i suppose uh of the church which includes uh, a great weight of that history in those people called the apostolic fathers and the church fathers and all of that and they really take up this great weight of what we think of in church history but those who were really i believe the great saints of god throughout the history thus far of the church are names you will never hear and that is very much who we are we are the names you will not hear our names are written in heaven so it does not matter it does not matter that we have no great name it doesn't matter if we never have a great name what matters is that the events of our lives and we hope the events of our deaths will go to further advance the kingdom of God so who cares if we have a name or not we're gonna talk about a church who has a great name and a great reputation and it's not a good thing so for starters before I even go through the few churches before to illustrate to you why I believe we are where we are as far as the church age I will tell you as I've said a few times in former videos that I believe we are in the early stages of the church in Philadelphia I don't believe that this church age has advanced very much as of this point in time I do believe that it is in its infancy and you'll see why as we go now if this is the case then we have this age of Philadelphia to be lived out we don't know if it will be long or it will be short these church ages have not proven to be equal in length so the the question isn't I mean if there were possibly a hundred years to go could two churches tur church ages exist um, sequentially in that time and the answer is well absolutely yes they could because they're not restricted to a certain set specific nor equal time frame so yes I believe that we are at the beginnings of the time of Philadelphia which should give everyone out there a great deal of joy a great deal of hope not everything is dark and there's a reason why we should have great great hope um, everyone in every church age should have hope should have hope and faith in their Lord Jesus Christ and God our Savior but there's specific reasons based on the message that Jesus gave to Philadelphia why we should be so excited about being at the beginnings of the time of the age of the Church of Philadelphia now we will have to start in Revelation chapter 2 the message to the Church of Ephesus this is the first church Jesus addresses I'm going to read the message to each church and as I do I'm going to point out the things about those churches that he is addressing that have been echoed in church ages since 90 AD to show you why I circumstantially believe that our world is going to be soon seeing the age of the Philadelphian church manifesting itself so we start with uh, to the church at Ephesus and keep in mind all of the symbolism used in these messages is so in-depth and any one of us could spend a lifetime unpacking 
sometimes I don't like that term, but unpacking these messages to see all of the symbolism used and how we can apply that to the different manifestations of the church since 90 AD. So Revelation 2.1 To the angel of the assembly in Ephesus write, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he who walks among the seven gold lampstands, says these things, I know your works and your toil and perseverance, and that you can't tolerate evil men, and have tested those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and found them false. You have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I am coming to you swiftly and I will move your lamp stand out of its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of my God. Remember, Jesus has a God. So, if the church at Ephesus being addressed here were to represent the church as a whole um, in 90 AD, and there's actually a lot of material in the New Testament about the church at Ephesus from Acts, the letter to the Ephesians, and then first and second Timothy. Paul had to send Timothy there as a representative of himself. Timothy was not a pastor. They call it the pastoral epistles. He was not. In those epistles, in the epistle of Titus, we can find what the requirements for elders and deacons are. but there's a great deal of material concerning Ephesus. And he says that their works were very good, that they could not stand evil men. They tried those who called themselves apostles, found them to be false. But he said the thing that he had against Ephesus and that he told them to repent of is that they left their first love. Well, a lot of people who believe that these seven churches do represent uh, each an individual age, um, some of them will say that the problem then with this church was that they left uh, the gospel message of grace and went back to works, maybe like in the same way that uh, the Galatians went back to circumcision in the in the sense that they were adding circumcision to the gospel message of grace in Jesus Christ as if you had to also be circumcised um, and you know that of course would be a big problem this mouse is acting funny sorry But I don't see that as the case. When I read the what they who they call the Apostolic Fathers, who would have lived, I guess they would say, around the late first century and then the second century, and that they say that the Didache is also an authentic document from maybe either the late first century or the second century. I I really don't know about that whether that's authentic or not. I mean, they found it in like the 1800s in a monastery. Um, that should send up red flags. But based on their writings and what they believed, 
it definitely seems like the the church as a whole if the letter to or the message to Ephesus is representing the church as a whole in the first century they were all given pure apostolic doctrine directly from the apostles of Jesus Christ and it certainly seems to me that what happened was instead of clinging to that original apostolic doctrine <clears throat> they allowed their churches to depart from that and begin taking on a structure and a function that was one that was more worldly or resembled more the pagan religions than those that would have reflected the pure apostolic doctrine we see very early on that there were even being appointed chief bishops in cities now at first i guess when when some people consider um well like irenaeus um and he would have been the um, the head bishop of Antioch. You know, they see them as godly men, who even in the fact of Irenaeus was said to have been taken to Rome and martyred, or same with Polycarp, who they say was uh, a direct disciple of the apostle John again martyred but it certainly seems that based on the earliest writings that I know of the structure of the church was not as the apostles had intended it to be The apostles intended on the church having multiple elders shepherding the people and multiple deacons taking care of physical needs. And these were not uh, overlords. They were servants. They, those who, elders who served well were to be given double honor, not pay, honor and the church was also supposed to be made up of those having multiple various gifts prophets evangelists apostles teachers shepherds and from the earliest times what I see is that structure of the church giving way to what would ultimately though it would take time would ultimately manifest itself as what we now call the Roman Catholic Church so I believe that they did leave their first love that pure apostolic teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ how he instructed that we are to love one another and to serve him in all faith and love and hope I believe they left that now <clears throat> the first church age I think it probably only really lasted into 
sometime in the second century before we go into Smyrna. The message to Smyrna reads, To the angel of the assembly in Smyrna write, The first and the last, who was dead and who has come to life, says these things. I know your works, oppression, and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, and they are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of the things which you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have oppression for ten days. Be faithful to death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. He who overcomes won't be harmed by the second death. Now, there were martyrs in the first century, but there began a series of persecutions after that time. And it started during the Flavian dynasty of Caesars. It seemed to peak um, during the time of Diocletian. But the thing is, it didn't necessarily stop at Constantine. Constantine simply legalized Christianity. It was illegal. Many, many Christians died during these times. And even those who weren't keeping the pure apostolic faith, uh, they were not immune to the persecutions that arose. They were massive. The church had really no power. They had no wealth, um, no gain. They had uh, against them not only the Roman Empire, but also all of the Jews and all of the synagogues spread throughout the known world where Christianity was being preached. And as we see in the first century, um, the two greatest persecuting factors against the early church was the government of Rome and those calling themselves Jews running the local synagogues. It is said by those who have researched concerning the Sabbath, how the church stopped keeping the Sabbath and why, that around the time of the second century, the Jews in their synagogues were making traditions that were pronouncing curses on Jesus Christ and Christians to where Christians couldn't even attend synagogues anymore, which they would. They would attend the synagogues so that they would hear the Tanakh. Like in Acts 15 when they said that isn't Moses read in every synagogue on the Sabbath? So they would go here to hear scriptures read. That was their scriptures. And they had the letters of Paul and general epistles of Peter and John also that were being passed around and hand copied when they had enough paper to do this. Um, paper wasn't a, an abundant thing at that time. So... Very few people had books, and even copying letters and getting them spread around was a big deal. So the Jews at that time were in their synagogues, making it harder and harder and harder for those who held to the testimony of Jesus Christ to occupy the same space as them. And they were being pushed out of the synagogues, and they were being continually demonized by the government of Rome in all the provinces. And they underwent a 
a great period of persecutions that, as I said, it didn't necessarily stop with Constantine. He legalized it, but the thing you have to remember, even after he legalized it, there were those like Athanasius who between him and Arius and those who uh, held to the doctrine of Arius, which was in a way sort of more of a binatarian doctrine than a unitarian doctrine, um, those who believed what Arius believed, believed that Jesus was not a co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, and those who believed what Arius did believed that he was, and in fact the Holy Spirit was too. This was the impetus of Trinitarianism, and for well over 50 years more Christian blood was spilled in that time than probably in all of the persecutions before that time. There was a great deal of Christian persecutions that happened in those few centuries from around the second century, possibly late second century, until up into about the fourth century. It was massive persecutions, massive persecutions. And now we know that the Romish church, which calls itself these days Catholicism, um, which sits in the Vatican, we know that they were responsible for a great many Christian deaths. Um, most specifically, uh, from around the 13th century on to about the 16th century, they did the greatest amount of damage and pure raw carnage and bloodshed towards them. This is true, but what's been wiped from the records, uh, to a large extent, is all the bloodshed that occurred from the second century to the fourth or from the late 200s till probably about the early 400s so there we have Smyrna the next one is Pergamum and Revelation 2:12, Jesus says to the angel of the assembly in Pergamum write he who has the sharp two-edged sword says these things I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold firmly to my name, and didn't deny my faith in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to throw a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans likewise. Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, to him I will give of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows but he who receives it. Pergamum. <clears throat> you break down Pergamum, it means married to power. You can break down the names of each one of these churches. The former church, Smyrna, Fragrant Oil. Pergamum, married to power. Now, we see that from the time of Constantine on, now Constantine legalized Christianity, but later on it was made the state church of Rome. This was after the time of Constantine. Constantine didn't do that. 
Constantine did act as Pontifus Maximus. He did preside over uh, the Council of Nicaea, and he did by force make so-called peace in his empire amongst Christians. But it was later on that the church decided to become married to power, the state religion, that is Pergamum. Now, if you consider what Balaam did by advising Balak and what he should do um, with Israel, and consider the fact that Balaam was a prophet of Yahweh. Do not forget that. There's such a richness to all of the language that our Lord uses here. It's just phenomenal. So Pergamum, this is when the church married power. This is the preliminary stages of the beast who was about to come up out of the abyss and ultimately go into destruction. Now, what happened in this time from around the 400s on? Because uh, the Bishop of Rome gained more and more power, of course, as did local, uh, well, city bishops around the empire. Um, those who I believe were holding to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which you can break that word down to, meaning conquering the people, which is not something that uh, the shepherds of the church should ever do. Pay attention to when Jesus, what he says to James and John, and when the apostles are arguing over who's the greatest, he says the princes of the Gentiles, they lord their position over them. They put the people underneath them. He said it will not be that way with you, but whoever would be the greatest among you, let him become your servant. So you had the doctrine of the Nicolaitans um, at that time. Um, he said, Balaam advised Balak to throw a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. Sexual immorality always being equated in apocalyptic and prophetic literature to idolatry, whoring after other gods, going after other gods, not holding to that pure doctrine of one God and the Shema as we understood in the first century, the God of Jesus Christ. And Jesus wasn't a Trinitarian either. So this is that time. And, of course, many who were truly Christians would have to eventually leave this system because they saw that it was a corrupt system. And it just became more and more corrupt. Now, in my worldview, we have the Church of Pergamum beginning and arising in the 4th century, in the 5th century. Most people kind of agree that the Pontifex Maximus, the Bishop of Rome, was given his full temporal powers by the then um, Emperor of Constantinople. Um, I think it was uh, Justinian. They believe it's 538 because many people, you know, if you if you make it 538, then 1798 makes 1260 years. And it's all neat and clean. Some who dissent from that would say it was the early 600s. They give reasons for that, too. But anyways, this is the time of Pergamum. Now, the thing is, and this is, again, this is how my, my worldview sees it based on other things that are factoring into my worldview, is that it was during the time of Pergamum that we lost those years. Now, if you understand the reasons that not lost those years, but gained those years, sorry, 
if you understand the reasoning but behind um, Illig and Scott's theories of the 300 phantom years, you would understand why they would have been inserted. So you go from about, let's just say for the sake of being neat and clean, you go from about 620 and then you've got to jump forward to 920. Now only a year has passed, but uh, the way history looks back on it these days, it looks like there was 300 years time then. But it wasn't really that much time. The Church of Pergamum had only been the prevailing church for a couple of hundred years. And what happens is that church, well, as it's said, it is the impetus of what becomes the great world power in the papacy and the Roman Church and then the Holy Roman Empire, which was all of those ten kingdoms, three being uh, overthrown as the papacy ascended into power in about the you know sixth century, the 500s. And then as you emerge in the 900s, then you see the, um, the Crusades uh, start happening. <clears throat> and there is, of course, more and more dissent even from within the so-called church. Uh, you have the formation of the Eastern Orthodox Church, breaking away from the uh, power and control of the Western Church based in Rome. Um, and by this time, that really isn't much the church anymore. It's, it's become literally the beast, the first beast of Revelation 13. All of the true Christians um, are not a part of this church um, very similar to the way things are going these days is, is those who are truly filled with the Holy Spirit are finding themselves they can't really function in the popular church of the day and have gone out and away and they are going to begin communities away from the, uh, the, the great monster that has become the church of Pergamum and they are going to start uh, a number of communities uh, oftentimes denouncing this church, denouncing the papacy, and um, that's going to lead us into the church in Thyatira. So there were many breakaway churches, and the more you dig into history, the more you'll find them breaking away from this church at Pergamum, because it, in fact, is the apostate church who ultimately gives birth to the man of sin, the Antichrist, who is the dynasty of popes, the papacy. So now, the church of Thyatira, in Revelation 2.18, to the angel of the assembly in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished brass, says these things, I know your works, your love, faith, service, patient endurance, and that your last works are more than your first. But I have this against you. You tolerate your woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a bed and those who commit adultery with her into great oppression, unless they repent of, the, of her works. I will kill her children with death, and all the assemblies will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But to you I say, to the rest who are in Thyatira, as many as don't have this teaching, who don't know what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I'm not putting on you any other burden. Nevertheless, hold that which you have firmly until I come. He who overcomes, and he who keeps my words to the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, shattering them like clay pots, as I also have received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. So now,
listening to this message to the church at Thyatira, I would think that most would see this and understand this as the church who had to leave that apostate abomination that had increased in great power in Satan's seat in Rome. And they were groups like the Waldenses and those who uh, followed Hus. Um, and even, you know, late period um, groups like, I would say, the Lollards, Huguenots. But specifically, who I see him speaking to here in Thyatira is those that we call the Reformers. He tells them their last works are greater than their former works. Absolutely. This is very true. The Reformation was an astoundingly excellent thing to happen to the whole world, and specifically the church, to depart from this great beast that had grown in Rome, calling itself a church. And the thing is, when he addresses Thyatira, he tells them, Yes, he sees their works, love, faith, service, patient endurance, and they had to have patient endurance. They endured, they endured that beast for hundreds of years until finally what we see is the time of the Reformation. Even though Hus was, was killed a hundred years before Luther was raised up, but he tells them, even so, even though your last works are greater than your former works, the problem you have is you tolerate your woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And one of the greatest problems with the reformers that people today that are part of the... Um, establishment church are not admitting, won't admit, the reformers had a few good works. They publicly identified the papacy as the Antichrist, not a specific pope, the papacy as the Antichrist. They were the first resounding voice that did that, though some did sparsely before that. The problem is that they kept so many of her doctrines. They put up with her doctrines. They were often trying to reform her as opposed to, and this is one of the biggest problems with people who consider themselves today neo-reformers, they don't understand that's not what we want to be aiming for. We do not want to be aiming for the Reformers' doctrines. We want to be aiming for the first century pure apostolic doctrines, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we want to aim for. And the Reformers, they did not have that doctrine. They had a few things good, but they did not have that doctrine. And they tolerated that woman, Jezebel. I find it interesting that, the, that Catholicism is in general a Marian cult. And Christ says, you, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. That's very interesting. Just a side note. So, everything you see about this message should scream reformers. I mean, from the Reformation, so many things happened. I mean, you know, King Henry VIII leaving the Catholic Church, starting the Anglican Church, which started so many things in motion that actually freed many many men who were under the oppressive boot of Rome for so long. What happened in, in Holland with the uh, Holland um, colonies, the Chiliads breaking away from, from Roman control, and how Jesus says here that 
that woman, he gave her time to repent, and she wouldn't. And so he was going to kill her children with death. And after this time, we see these terrible wars breaking out throughout the Catholic-dominated countries, France, the French Revolution, and Spain, how when she went to war with England, um, she was absolutely devastated. There was plagues throughout Europe. Um, these things all happened to the church in Thyatira. It's an absolute fallacy to equate the um, reformers or the church of this time to the Philadelphian church for those who have. That's an absolute fallacy. Now, <clears throat> let's get on to the church of Sardis. In Revelation 3.1, Jesus says to the church of Sardis, And to the angel of the assembly in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says these things, I know your works, that you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and keep the things that remain, which you are about to throw away, for I have found no works of yours perfected before my God. Jesus has a God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If therefore you won't watch, I will come as a thief, and you won't know what hour I will come upon you. Nevertheless, you have a few names in Sardis that didn't defile their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will be arrayed in white garments, and I will in no way blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. So now Sardis. After the time of the Reformation, when a lot of really phenomenal uh, events in the world were happening, uh, this is also the time when the Counter-Reformation uh, arose, being the, the Jesuits um, and all of their dirty, foul deeds. This, of course, I believe also being the third woe, the Jesuits, actually, being, being a judgment on um, both Catholic and um, apostate Protestant churches. But, okay, so what happens is because of uh, King Henry VIII doing what he did, um, the wars throughout Europe, um, people were absolutely sick and tired of the rule of the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire and their boots on their necks. And not only did many countries overthrow that uh, so-called church in their countries, but many people like the um, Huguenots and even those who were by this time after uh, a good century of being under the Anglican Church, which was really just the Roman Church for England with the king being their sovereign, uh, they left, um, many of them starting colonies in the Americas. And uh, also, with there being a great missionary push from the time of the end of Thyatiran Church, the Thyatiran Church, um, many Protestant churches were springing up all over the place. And, uh, of course, they were being known by different denominations. Um, so thus you have here where Jesus says um, there are a few names in Sardis that didn't defile their garments, denominations, names that didn't defile their garments. Uh, there were some denominations uh, throughout this church age that didn't defile their garments and they remained um, very pure to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, there have been some that we don't hear of much unless what we hear about them is inflammatory. Who were, uh, they, they, they didn't embrace the ideas of the reformers in the way that the reformers still tolerated that woman Jezebel in Rome um, and even 
uh, in Constantinople too. I mean, she was she had spread uh, <laughs> around throughout the empire. Um, there have been a number of churches um, in this time of Sardis that didn't defile their garments, and they very much longed to <laughs> stay with the original pure apostolic doctrine, gospel of Jesus Christ. But the thing is, from the time post-Reformation to today, the Protestant church, which is now known typically as the Evangelical Church, has gained a great name and reputation worldwide. This is the church that Jesus is speaking to. He says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. It is my sincere hope, it really is, that we are at least in the transitional period to Philadelphia. Now, the reason it's my sincere hope is because I know what is in my heart. I know what is in the heart of so many. And I know that there are so many out there, and the numbers are growing, that are entirely disenfranchised by this church who has a reputation for being alive, but is dead. What happened is, over time, the Protestant church was afforded a great deal of freedom. And so she built. She built universities. She financed massive mission efforts. She did such a great deal of good. But the thing is, over the years, not only was she infiltrated by the Counter-Reformation, Jesuits in disguise as Protestants, to soil her good name and her good works and to breed dissension, but, as what seems to happen so often when our forefathers work so hard at something to establish something and to leave us something, we grow lazy and spoiled and don't appreciate it. We allow greedy men to uh, come in amongst us, making merchandise of us, teaching false doctrines, <clears throat> and uh, giving us what our itching ears desire. And, you know, what the United States, uh, for example, puts out to the rest of the world, the rest of the world that, that aren't as privileged as us, and this is also the case with the UK and Australia and South Africa, many of the churches that are rooted in these countries and who go abroad spreading the quote-unquote gospel good news around are health wealth churches who just take advantage of people this has been going on for a long time this is the church that jesus is speaking to in the form of sardis and like i said I am so hopeful that we are at the beginnings of Philadelphia. With all my heart, I hope that my son is able to experience the Philadelphian church becoming into its, its full expression, if I don't see it with my own eyes. So, now we have all these people who are seeing through all of this evil, of these bad works, of this church who has a great name for being alive, but is dead. And that brings us to Philadelphia. Revelation 3.7, to the angel of the assembly in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one can shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says these things. I know your works. Behold, 
I have set before you an open door which no one can shut, that you have a little power, and kept my word, and didn't deny my name. Behold, I give some of the synagogue of Satan, of those who say they are Jews, and they are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you kept my command to endure. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, which is to come on the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold firmly that which you have, so that no one takes your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out from there no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. And at this point in time, my circumstantial worldview is that we are going into this Philadelphian church age. We are not in the time of Laodicea. We are not in between the sixth and seventh vials. There's time yet to go. But be watchful. Don't let this, don't let this make you lazy. Um, remember, Jesus says he's coming quickly. And he means it. He is. We don't know how long a certain church age is. And, you know, more and more will be revealed to us concerning Revelation and the full cycle of things as time goes on. If we are pure in heart and we hold to the things that he gives us in purity and we don't charge our brothers for this, but labor in love trusting in God to pay our bills and to get us by, not loving the things of this world, nice homes and pretty things, sumptuous foods. Not that those things are evil in and of themselves, but the burdens that professing Christians put on other Christians. Behold, I will be your minister and your servant for a fee that won't fly. And I believe that Church of Philadelphia are going to be marked by our love one for another. Phileo is the Greek form of love um, for humanity, um, one person to another. And Delphi is the city. This church is the city of brotherly love. We must love one another beyond our comfort zones because that's, that's the church of Sardis. That's the church that its, it's, it's congregants, its parishioners, its, its clergy, it's peopled with people who love their own comfort, their own space above the brethren. The Church of Philadelphia will not be so. Be excited to be part of this church. Be part of this church. Jesus says, I have set before you an open door, and I believe that those who cling to his gospel, don't deny his name, will have that open door before them. Now another reason that I believe that we are on the cusp of Philadelphia, remember he says, I give some of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and they are not, but lie, behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet. The Church of Smyrna had serious problems with the Jews in the synagogues, causing a great rift between 
what was the practice of Judaism and knowing and understanding the Tanakh um, and Christians, they persecuted them and threw them out of their synagogues. And again, today, we have this nation state of Israel and all of these, they call themselves Christian Zionists, but a Zionist can't be a Christian, um, supporting this brute state of Israel. And you have these Jewish roots movements, and you have all of these different groups trying to say that they are Israel, and they're all missing the plot. And there's not love one for another. So that's, that's where I believe we are in time. On the cusp of the Church of Philadelphia, and I am glad for every single day I see more of it. <clears throat> so I want to encourage everybody that is listening to this, knowing that Jesus has not abandoned his church. His revelation will come about just just as he just as he delivered it to John, just as God gave it to him. You can read, in a sense, if you want to read uh, the parallels of where the Philadelphian church is in time, um, you know, going from Revelation 13 through 15, I think is going to give you a great idea of where Philadelphia is falling uh, into the scheme of everything. And you'll notice by, by the language used, in those chapters, specifically chapter 14. So, the days for us should not be dark, though we live in dark times. Let's not lose hope, even though we are surrounded by lies, deceptions, and the church at large is not what the church should be as it was given that pure gospel was given by the apostles in the first century but don't lose heart or lose hope we're going to see wonderful things and that may come with a great deal of persecution this is true but rejoice because persecution and tribulation produces perseverance, proven character, and ultimately hope. Believe me, there's nothing that we could go through that we will not be accompanied by our Lord Jesus Christ, who went through far more than we will. He has always been there for us, and he will always be there for us. So with that, I'm concluding this video. Uh, hopefully next time I'll be talking about where we are as far as what date and what year and why I believe that. Give you the Cliff Notes version and not the long drawn out version which is the guide to the Phantom Dark Age but give you some very key points and why I think we are in that year and then we'll have to sort of interpret some things that have happened um, in the centuries before uh, where we are right now to try to make sense of everything try to make sense of everything because there exists in this world a canker that has robbed us of our history, um, our knowledge and understanding, and continually seeks to rob us of the last shreds of freedom that we have and would ultimately take away any and all truth from us. That's what they've been working at for centuries now. But our Lord will not allow that and he will truly keep us, the remnant church. And he is very gracious. And our God is mighty. 
is all-powerful. And remember, all things work for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. So, that's good news indeed. So until next time, remember, Jesus is Lord, and His God and our God, His Father and our Father, His kingdom is forever, and I am your servant. Farewell.